Let's look at six top reasons why a swordsman absolutely should practice against bayonet. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator, and welcome to my garden here. So I'm considering the um, subject of sword versus bayonet. Now this is a very, very popular topic in the Georgian and Victorian eras. So end of the 18th, right the way through, in fact, to the early 20th century, and you could say up to World War One. One of the reasons being that this is the officer officer's weapon of self-defense by default and this is of course the main uh, private soldier's weapon of offense and self-defense um, by default and so inevitably these two things came up against each other in the age of gunpowder and of course we should also mention that swords were used by cavalry and also cutlasses were used by sailors and these were also used by cavalry artillery and by sailors as well in various different forms. Usually they had shorter forms of it. This here incidentally is a Martini Henry uh, Mark II and it has the long bayonet attached to it. Um, so for various reasons, because they were commonly came up against each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the 19th century, it was a subject of much debate, which is better, sword or bayonet? As for which is better, well, you'll find exponents of both. Some people thought the sword was better, some people thought the bayonet was better. And even today that uh, debate continues and is practiced in the fencing cells of many HEMA clubs around the world. But I'm not gonna look at that specific topic here. What I'm gonna look at is six reasons why the person who is a swordsman practicing saber, backsword, cutlass, these late period uh, military weapons, spadroon as well, why you absolutely should practice against bayonets whenever you get the chance. Before we jump into that, I want a quick word about our amazing sponsor for this video, who are Mova Globes. So I'm absolutely stoked today to be sponsored by Mova Globes because it means I get my hands on one. And this is absolutely lovely. Um, when I first saw these, I was gobsmacked. I was like, how do they work? They're powered by light, in case you're wondering. As you know, on this channel, I'm often talking about history in relation to geography as well, whether we're talking about weapons that were used in specific areas of the world, or we're talking about ethnographic weapons from specific areas of the world. We're often talking about geography on this channel, whether you realize it or not. It's amazing, look, you can actually hold it and it still rotates around. It's really, really mesmerizing. And everybody in my family now wants one. Um, Lucy wants one on her desk and both my kids want one. <laughs> they think this is absolutely incredible. So this is gonna be in our, uh, in our sitting room and it's a great way of engaging kids with geography as well and, and showing them where the countries are and where you've traveled and this kind of stuff. This is the first of its kind in the, in the world as far as I'm aware. There's no electricity required, there's, uh, there's no cable or anything like that it's powered by magnets and the light so it will just keep turning the example I picked here as you can see is quite traditional and Victorian in fact in design and coloration uh, which which appeals to me but in fact there's over 40 different designs uh, different colors uh, artworks historical artworks uh, the space inspired ones um, with graphics from NASA and this kind of stuff so check out movaglobes.com and you can see the variety on offer right there and as a special offer to scholar gladiatoria of viewers I've got a special offer for you you can get 10% off the six inch or eight and a half inch globes at Mova Globes right now using the link below and the code SCHOLAR in capital letters um, so you can help yourself to one of these right now and I love it so thanks once again to Mova Globes for sponsoring this video so back to this question, what are the best reasons why a person who practiced swordsmanship of the late industrial era gunpowder age should absolutely practice against the firearm with bayonet attached as often as possible? Well, the most obvious answer, and I think the one that I really want you, if you don't pay any attention to the rest of the video, the one that I really want to, uh, you to hold with you in your brains and remember, is that you've got to remember that anybody who is using a sword, whether it's uh, infantry or artillery, artillery or engineer's officer, or whether it's a cavalryman who happens to be on foot, or whether it's a sailor with a cutlass, pretty much all of those on a uh, late 18th or 19th or even early 20th century battlefield, most of the opponents they will come up against, certainly in a European or Western war, will be equipped with a firearm with a bayonet attached. So it's simply a matter of statistics and odds the fact is that if you're training with a sword the fact is if you go into war skirmishing raiding whatever patrolling 
the most likely opponent you're going to come up against is someone equipped with one of these. And it doesn't matter whether it's the trenches of World War I or um, a siege during the Indian Mutiny or the Crimean War or the Napoleonic Wars. It doesn't really make a difference. The fact is that most opponents are going to have a long arm, as we call it, so a musket or a rifle, with a long spike or bayonet attached to the end of it. So in terms of purely what's the most effective thing for you to train from a martial point of view, from a military point of view, training swordsmanship against the bayonet is incredibly important, probably more important than training sword against sword because you're actually relatively less likely, much, much less likely to come up against an opponent with a sword than you are against an opponent with a bayonet. So the next reason why even if your principal interest is swordsmanship of this era and you're practicing lots of sabre or spadroon, um, the reason why you should practice against bayonet as often as possible is because by and large the bayonet has a big advantage, certainly in certain ways. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to delve into the depths of uh, strengths and weaknesses of the two here, which I've covered in previous uh, videos, and I'll probably look at again in the future in a dedicated video. But the fact is, it's really difficult to go up against bayonets for essentially three main reasons, okay? One is reach, okay? So if you're holding the bayonet of this, if you have the hand forward, you'll actually notice that the length of the sword blade is roughly the same length as from the tip of the bayonet to the lead hand. Okay, so that's something you have to be aware of as someone using a bayonet. However, you can slip that hand down and you've now essentially increased the reach of your weapon down to here. So you can get a huge amount of reach just by moving the lead hand. And in fact, you can bring it all the way back to the trigger guard like that and still stab two-handed with an incredibly long reach on it. But if you really want to, not everybody advises this, but it's certainly in Victorian Britain and in France as well, in the uh, Third Empire, a popular form of um, stabbing with the bayonet was actually one-handed. Now, this is a heavy object. This weighs about nine pounds, which when you hold it out at arm's length feels pretty heavy because it's a long lever. But if you lance the thing out one-handed, you can do it quick enough for one stab and then retract. So if you're fighting someone conventionally like this, but then you go smack and then bring it straight back, it's actually relatively manageable, especially with practice. So that means this has got a huge reach. The other advantage is you've got two hands on the weapon, so you've got greater leverage. The third one is weight. Now, weight can be a drawback as well because it makes the weapon more cumbersome and tiring to use and a bit slower. But, that being said, in a bind, when the two weapons are against each other, the weight of this tells out, especially when it's held in two hands. So, reach, two-handedness, other, other words, extra leverage, and mass or weight um, mean that this is a formidable weapon to fight against and therefore if you're practicing swordsmanship with a sword, a saber, you should try and practice against that as often as possible to get used to it. So the third reason why you should practice sword against bayonet is a little bit thinking outside the box and probably a bit obscure to some of you watching this. But simply, if you are an infantry officer or artillery officer or whatever, most of your job is commanding men, okay? Most of your job is to lead. That's why you carry a sword and a pistol. They're weapons of self-defense rather than offense. Your primary job is yourself, not to be going and capturing positions. It's utilizing your men and commanding your men to do that for you and leading by example, admittedly. So being armed is a good thing and you have to stay alive in order to <laughs> command. So having weapons of self-defense is definitely a good thing. But the fact is that your real weapon is your men. Now your men, are equipped with the musket and bayonet or rifle, rifle and bayonet later on. And if you have a better understanding of how to use the sword against the bayonet, obviously that's good for you personally, but it's also good for them because you understand the weapon of your men better. You're able to advise them and guide them and observe if they're doing anything wrong. So you're going to be a better leader for understanding the weapons of your men and how they should use them and see if there's any deficiencies in their training that needs to be addressed. Moreover, remember that in the 19th century context, a lot of wars happened in a colonial situation in India, China, Afghanistan, North Africa, all over the place, South Africa, everywhere, basically. And a lot of the opponents that 
you know, British or French or Spanish um, or Prussian armies came up against weren't actually other Europeans with European weapons. They were sometimes people who used swords. So very often your men would be facing people with swords. So whilst it's true to say that in a European or Western context, as a swordsman, most of your opponents probably most of the time are going to have a bayonet. If your men, if you're now serving in India or um, South Africa, most of your opponents are not going to have a firearm with a bayonet attached, or at least a lot of them won't. A lot of them will have other forms of weapon, one of those being a sword. So if we're in Afghanistan with the chura or kyber knife or the pulwa, or if we're in India with the talwa, uh, or if we're in Morocco, for example, with the Nimcha, the fact is that your men are going to be going with their bayonets against swordsman opponents. So again, it's useful for you un to understand how a sword opposes a bayonet, because you can reverse engineer that and help your men understand how best to overcome their swordsman opponents. So number four reason is simply that as a swordsman, even if your focus is on sword and your focus is on sword versus sword, Practicing occasionally, or as often as you can, against the bayonet with attached to the musket or rifle makes you a more rounded and complete martial artist and swordsman. It helps you understand the strengths and weaknesses of your weapon to a greater extent. For example, the importance of parrying with the base of the blade, how weak the foible of a blade can be, the importance of the guard, the importance of certain binds, because you're stretched to the max when dealing with a bayonet opponent, you have to be more in command of your distance and measure. You need to be more in command of the bind. Grapples and grabs are far more featured in saber material against the bayonet than in saber versus saber, for example. So in other words, it makes you a far more rounded and complete and better trained fighter. Moreover, if you yourself are actually sometimes taking the part of the bayoneteer, it means you're learning a whole new weapon system. And in itself, you know, this is a heavy, cumbersome weapon that's got different ways of using it to the sword, even different footwork. The fact that you're predominantly left foot lead uh, and the fact that you've got two hands on the weapon and you use both ends of the weapon as well. So the fact is you're learning a whole new repertoire of stuff for this, but you're also learning a fairly new repertoire of stuff for the sword as well. So it makes you a far more complete fighter. Right, the fifth point is actually connected to the last one. And that is that fundamentally, although it's a very particular thing, a firearm with a, with a bayonet attached, it's quite heavy, in many ways, it's quite similar to other pole arms. Yes, it's a little bit shorter and a little bit heavier than most, for example, medieval or renaissance pole arms, such as partisans, bills, halberds, pole axes, things like this. It's about the same length and weight as a pole axe, actually, as it happens. Um, but nevertheless, the basic characteristics of using it are rather similar to lots of other types of spear and pole arm um, and, and you know, halberd and things like this and glaive. So using it helps you understand those things, but moreover, fighting against it with a sword, equally, if you're training against bayonet, and this is really, really important in the 19th century context, if you're training on a regular basis against bayonet, it is by proxy gonna make you more effective at dealing with other similar weapons, which really training sword versus sword doesn't. If you only train saber versus saber, you are not going to be very well equipped at dealing with an opponent who is using a two-handed spear, or potentially even a spear and a shield, or a halberd, or a glaive, or something like this. And in a 19th century context, again, if you're a soldier or an officer in the 19th century, sailor, whatever, there is a very good chance you're going to find yourself fighting opponents in an area where they're not equipped in the same way as you or similar armies. They might be equipped with glaives or spears or swords. And so training against the bayonet equally, therefore, prepares you for fighting against other similar weapons that are different to the sword. And the sixth and final reason, do you know what? It's simple as this, it's fun. I highly, highly recommend it. There are a number of different bayonet simulators you can buy on the market these days, nylon ones and various other things, but you can make one as well. If you just make one out of wood uh, and you stick a padded end on the end, you can be careful with it. You can just use a wooden pole, it's not great. Ideally, you need something that's the right length 
and also approaching the correct weight as well because I have to say having trained a more moderate amount with uh, muskets and uh, rifles and bayonets their weight is one of their dictating factors to the whole situation the whole equation uh, so if you make one very light it's like a spear but it's not really like a bayonet but anyway um, if you get some kind of simulator it's extremely good fun and do you know what I've known people in my clubs and I've seen people from other clubs who are really good sword versus sword because they train that one two three times a week week in week out year in year out but then they never practice against things like spears or bayonets or sword and shield or whatever. It's really, really good. If you're training regularly, why not fit it into your regular training? Even if it's just one bout once a week to make you come out of your traditional patterns of, of fighting, defense and offense, and make you think outside the box a bit. And fighting against a spear, if you're doing medieval martial arts, for example, do it against a spear or a pole axe or a glaive or whatever if you're doing Victorian or uh, Georgian or later in fact do it against bayonets because it, it is really good fun makes you really think outside the box and I think overall makes you a far more effective martial artist and far more rounded uh, and less of just a sal fencer and more doing real historical European martial arts I hope this has been enjoyable and thought-provoking to watch. I hope that some of you go away and actually go and do some sword versus bayonet with whatever you can uh, obtain. You can use a single stick and a, a, and a long bayonet wooden simulator. Uh, you can get an old paddle or something and make something, but you can, you can cobble together things, or if, you can, if you've got access to really good simulators, then obviously use those as well. Anyway, I hope this has been useful. Thanks again to our sponsors. Check out the links below for those. And um, yeah, I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.